Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about a really cool extension, a follow-up to the simple, the vanilla, recurrent neural networks we studied in the last video. I'll link that video in the description below, but in a nutshell we said that there's this type of cool neural network called the recurrent neural network. It's very well suited to solving sequential prediction problems, like in natural language processing, given a sequence of words that forms a sentence, what word comes next, or a time series prediction problem, given a series of the prices of a stock, what will the price of the stock be on the next day? And as cool as recurrent neural networks are, we did say that one big drawback that really, really affects recurrent neural networks is the vanishing or exploding gradient problem. So we have a whole video on the vanishing gradient problem also linked in the description below. But in that video, we kind of just said that, hey, this problem affects RNNs, but we didn't really explain why or prove how. And that's exactly where our story begins in this video. In this video, we're going to be introducing an extension, as we said, called long short-term memory, which is a more complicated form of the recurrent neural network. And anytime we complicate things in data science or any other part of your life, the biggest question we should ask is why? What are we gaining by making this thing harder to understand, more complex, probably more computationally expensive to train? What are we gaining? What problem are we trying to solve? And that's exactly where our story gets started today. The first thing we'll do is revisit the simple or vanilla recurrent neural network that we studied in the last video and talk about where things can go wrong. So let's say we're trying to predict the next word given this sequence of words here. The dog ran up to the orange cat and did what? So there could be any number of things in this blank here, but I think most of us would say that it's important to think about the fact that you're talking about the dog in this moment. Because if you follow the sentence again, there's a dog, it ran up to this orange cat, and, well, what did the dog do? Did it bark at it? Did it chase it? There's going to be something here, but it pertains to the fact that we're talking about a dog. The interesting thing with this sentence is that between the thing we're talking about and the thing we're trying to predict, there's actually quite a few words to get through. And we see that that is going to be exactly the problem where the vanishing or exploding gradient arises. But we'll get there in a, just a moment. First, let's recap the structure of the simple recurrent neural network. And some of you might have noticed already, but I've simplified it even further than we did in the original video. And there's two reasons for that. The first one is that when we implemented recurrent neural networks in Python using the Keras package, we found that this is actually the structure they use. So this will be more in line with the code. And the other reason is that the difference you probably noticed is that there's not a hidden state and an output state Y. There's no Ys anymore. We're just using the hidden state H as the output state itself. And that's exactly the choice that the LSTM or long short-term memory does as well. So it'll make our transition from simple RNNs to LSTMs easier as well. So recapping how this all works, we have all these X's, X1, X2, each one representing a word. It's the embedding of a word in our sentence. And by embedding, we just mean it's some vector. It could be a small vector, like three elements, it could be a large vector, like 256 elements but it basically captures some kind of meaning of that word. So the power or the key idea behind recurrent neural networks of any kind is that anytime we're predicting what the next word would be, so let's say we've looked up to the dog ran up, well, what comes next? This prediction, H4, of the next word, if you follow what arrows are going into it, is dependent on the most recent word that we're looking at, so the word ups vector, and H3, which is the hidden state which is one and the same in this case as the output state from the previous time step. And what is that dependent on? That's dependent on the word that came before and the previous hidden state. What's that dependent on? That's dependent on the word that came before that and the previous hidden state. So there's this really cool architecture here and this is the unrolled version. There's this really cool architecture where anytime you're trying to predict the next thing in your sequence, you have access to the current word you're looking at and also the previous hidden state, which is implicitly capturing information about all the previous words in the sentence as well. So that means that theoretically, when we get here to H9 and we're trying to predict what exactly did the dog do, we should theoretically have access to everything we need in the sentence. But the key word there is theoretically. Let's see where this can break down. And the way we're going to gauge that mathematically is using our old friend gradients. And so we're going to ask this question of how does X2 which is the embedding for the word dog, affect H9, which is the prediction of the next word after and. And if we find that for whatever reason this derivative, this impact of the word dog on the prediction after the word and, if for whatever reason that's exploding to infinity or vanishing to zero, we know we have a problem 
because that means the more words that we put between something we care about and something we're trying to predict based on the thing we care about, the harder and harder it is gonna be for this network to use that information. But let's see if that's true. So how would we go about calculating this? Well, we just follow the arrows. Honestly, neural networks are tricky for me to grasp sometimes, but what really helps me is drawing out diagrams and drawing arrows to what affects what, because that's exactly how we're going to write out our gradients. Again, the question is, how does x2 affect h9? Well, x2, the only thing that it affects first is h2, so we're gonna write that gradient first. x2 has some effect on h2. Now, h2, the only thing that it affects is h3, and so we'll write, how does h2 affect h3? h3, the only thing that that affects is h4, so that's the derivative of h4 with respect to h3, and so on and so on. We see that there's not too much interesting stuff going on, we're just kind of following these hidden states or output states down until we get to H9. So the final thing is how does H8 affect H9 signified by this arrow right here. So now we should probably write out the forms for each of these. Uh, I'm not gonna dwell too much on how exactly I got these forms here, but you can go back to the previous video and look at it, the exact mathematical forms for how each of these H's are computed based on the current X and the H before it. And you'll find that the first derivative here, that's the only kind of unique one because it involves an X and an H instead of just pairs of H's. This is going to be the matrix U, which is the matrix that multiplies on any given X and then times this function D of H2. And since I'm using a sigmoid activation layer here, this D of H anything is simply just a diagonal matrix whose diagonal is given by H, this weird symbol here times one minus H and this weird symbol here, which is gonna come up later in the video again, is called the element-wise multiplication, which just means that if I have one vector of size five and I have another vector of size five, what it means to element-wise multiply them is create a new vector whose first element is the product of the first elements of my individual vectors, the second element is the product of the second elements of my individual vectors, and so on and so on. And diag just means that take this vector and turn it into a matrix, by just putting that vector along the diagonal of my new matrix and everything else is gonna be equal to zero. This really doesn't matter too much for this video. I just wanted to be mathematically rigorous about what I'm writing down. Um, and you can use a different activation function instead of sigmoid here, you can use tan h or even a linear activation function might have been a better idea so we don't have to talk about this so much. But anyway, don't worry too much if this doesn't make sense. The key insight is that the derivative, the first one is u times that d of h2. Now things just get easier because there's just this repeatable pattern. What's the derivative of H2 with respect to H3? Well, that's going to be V, this matrix that multiplies each of the H's times the same D function of H3. What's the derivative of H3 with respect to H4? It's the same thing, it's just that we're putting an H4 there instead. And so all these derivatives, which are between pairs of H's are pretty much the exact same. The only difference is that this D function is accepting whatever H it's looking at at the moment. And so we have this big kind of like nasty looking form of derivative here. And I've written all the dimensions here in case you wanna trace it. So we said that our X's are in a K dimensional space and our H's are in a Z dimensional space. So you can see that by writing the dimensions under each of our matrices, the final product is in a K times Z dimensional space. Does that sanity check? Well, we're trying to ask for the derivative of H9 with respect to X2. X2 is a k-dimensional vector, so that makes sense why the first argument here should be k. And H9 is a z-dimensional vector, so the second argument here should be z. So at least all the dimensions check out, so we sanity check we're not making mistakes here. But what's the point? The point is not the math itself. The point is to look at the types of symbols that are contributing to this gradient. And the key thing to look at is that there's tons of these v's in this multiplication here. There's actually one V for every arrow we have here going along this chain of hidden states or output states until we get to the hidden state that we're trying to predict. And that's exactly where our story continues next. So there's lots of multiplications by V. And now you see where things start going wrong. The more distance we put between something we care about and something we're trying to predict in the sentence, which is trying to reference that thing we care about, because what's gonna happen in that giant gradient that we just computed is that you're gonna basically get V to the power of N, where N is the number of time steps you're putting between the thing you care about and the thing you're trying to predict. Now what happens mathematically to things in this matrix V if they are less than one 
Well, if you take something less than one and raise it to the power of larger and larger n's, that thing is going to vanish. Geometrically, it's going to go to zero. That's a vanishing gradient problem. Conversely, what happens if something in V is greater than one, like 1.02 even, given enough time, given enough size of this n, that thing's going to explode or go to infinity. And now we see what we hand waved in the last video about why we get this vanishing or exploding gradient problem really badly in recurrent neural networks, because we're taking the same matrix V and multiplying it several, several, several times. And even though theoretically, take a small number and multiply it many, many, many times, it'll not be zero. Computationally, our computers do have a limit both on the lower side near zero and on the upper side near infinity for what they're able to represent. And therefore, when we go to actually code these recurrent neural networks and we have a big enough sequence, we're going to get this vanishing gradient problem or this exploding gradient problem. Now, I wanna be clear here, this was a toy example. We only had about 10 words in our sentence. It's probably not gonna happen at 10 words, but you can imagine tons of applications in the real world where you have many more than 10 things in your input sequence. You're trying to input a whole paragraph or an entire book all at once. And on page 500 of the book, you're trying to reference some character who showed up on page one of the book. So you can see that this is not crazy for something that could happen and could be a problem for us. So in a nutshell, what's the problem? The problem is that in this simple or vanilla RNN, you'll hear these words interchangeably, simple RNN or vanilla RNN. It's just the thing we've studied in the last video. Uh, it's hard in those cases for past inputs to impact future predictions because of this vanishing or exploding gradient problem. And that's exactly the reason where LSTMs come in. So now we have a motivating factor for if we are going to complicate this, how are we gonna complicate it? What things are you trying to solve and why are you complicated in the first place? So we're gonna extend the simple RNN with the goal of letting the network pass information unchanged. Because if you go back to this architecture here, the whole reason this is happening is that when you're asking about how does X2 change H9, there's only one way for the information from X2 to get to H9 via this highway here. And this highway is full of these Vs who are basically just destroying your information little by little by little until there's no way for H9 to know what this word even was at that point. So the solution should be some form of letting the network pass that X2 unchanged all the way down to H9 or H100 or H1000 if it is helpful for H9 or H100 or H1000 to have access to that information. And that's exactly the goal we're gonna have in mind as we start explaining the step-by-step -step process by which we're building up these LSTM networks. So first, let's recap the pieces of information we have at each time step and a new piece of information we're going to add in order to meet this goal. So the pieces of information that we have at each time step that you already know about are X, which is the new piece of information you're considering, H, which is the hidden or output state from the previous time step. This we already know about. We're going to now add the crux, the key, the secret of LSTMs, which is this new vector C, the cell state. And the purpose, the goal, the job of the cell state is to remember long-term information if it is useful to the network at some point in the future. That's exactly what we were missing right now. There's no mechanism in the simple RNN to remember this short-term information long-term if it's helpful, but now we're giving it that ability. So that is extension number one. We're adding the cell state. And now let's talk about what is the cell state? How does it get set? What factors go into it? So let's go through the six steps for building up the LSTM. At any time step T, we now have three things that we're allowed to play with. So we just explained them here. We have the current new input, the new word, we have the hidden or output state from the previous time step. And now we have the cell state from the previous time step. So we're still not exactly sure what this is or how we're gonna use it, but hopefully through this six step process, it'll be more clear what it's trying to do and how it's trying to do it. Step one in the LSTM is to propose a new candidate cell state. So what we're saying here is basically, we'll need some cell state for the next time step. That's gonna be C sub T. But first, instead of just directly computing C sub T, Let's combine these other two pieces of information we have, the current input and the last hidden state, into a proposal or a candidate for what that next cell state might be. And we do that using this formula here. 
So we say that the proposed, so you can see it's proposed because it has a little squiggly tilde on top of it, the proposed candidate state for the next time step is going to be the tan h of just this linear function of the other two pieces of information we have. So you'll see that LSTMs just have a bunch more parameters. By parameters, I mean these u matrices, these v matrices, these b vectors. You'll see that I have a ton more parameters than vanilla recurrent neural networks, but these parameters follow a very predictable form in that they are linear combinations of your new input vector and your previous hidden state, and then you apply an activation function on top of that. So in this case, we're applying a tan h activation function. A tan h is able to squash information between negative one and one on this linear combination of the current information and the previous hidden state. So all we need to know now is that there is some proposed new cell state which is using the information from the current input state and the previous hidden state. Step two introduces the other key concept of LSTMs over the simple recurrent neural networks, which is that we're going to create something called a forget gate, which is this F sub T. And this F sub T's job is to decide what to keep or forget from the last cell state. And in terms of its form, you can see that it's pretty much parallel to the last form we looked at. It's also a linear combination of the current input state and the last hidden or output state. We're just using different matrices to do this linear combination. We're using u sub f because we're talking about the forget gate v sub f and b sub f. And instead of a tan h, we're using a sigmoid activation function. The reason we're using a sigmoid activation function here is because the sigmoid is exactly squashing numbers between zero and one. And because it squashes numbers between zero and one, we can interpret those zeros and ones as what fraction of information from some other vector you want to keep or forget. For example, if a number in this forget gate vector is 0.99, that means that whatever vector this gets multiplied by, which is going to be the last cell state, we're going to keep most of that information because for whatever reason, it's valuable. On the other hand, if some number in this forget gate is 0.01, .01, that means at that, that position of the vector of cell state, I wanna forget most of that information. It's not helpful for me to carry that any further in the network. It's not gonna help me predict any future words. And so this forget gate tells us how much we want to forget or remember from some other vector, which is going to be the cell state. And this will make more sense when we look at how this forget gate is actually used in step four. But for now, all we need to know is that it's some vector full of numbers between zero and one. The closer to one it is, the more information we want to remember. The closer to zero is, the less information we want to remember. Now, step three is a parallel to step two. It's just going to be applied onto a different vector. So this is called the input gate, and it has an identical form. So we don't need to go over the form again. As you can see, all we're doing here is just swapping out these matrices for different matrices, but the form is the exact same. This input gate is deciding how much to keep or forget, same function as the forget gate. It's just that it's applied to a different vector. This is applied to the new candidate cell state that we generated in step one. So now step four, I think, is really going to tie this current part of the story together. Because when I was just looking at steps one, two, and three, I was like, what is going on? Why are we creating all these vectors? But in step four, where we look at when we actually use these vectors, it makes a lot of sense exactly what we're trying to accomplish here. In step four is where we create the new cell state. So you can see here, we're setting C sub T. So we're asking, what is the new cell state gonna be? The new cell state is going to be some combination of the previous cell state, C sub T minus one, and the new candidate cell state, C tilde T. But the question is, which parts of each one are helpful to carry forward in this LSTM? And the answer of which parts are helpful to carry forward is answered exactly by the forget gate in step two and the input gate in step three. So you can see here that the forget gate is element wise multiplied. So I promised this weird symbol would come back and it's back. The forget gate is element wise multiplied by the previous cell state. So this part here is telling us how much information and which pieces of information, which positions in this vector do you want to remember? How much of them, which ones? That's exactly what this first component is telling us here. And in the same exact way, the second component here is answering that question for the candidate proposed new cell state, C tilde T. This input gate is telling us, I wanna keep 99% of the first position, I wanna keep 80% of the second position, I wanna keep 
0.0001% of the third position because it's not helpful to carry forward and so on and so on and so on. So that now you can think of this new cell state as a Frankenstein combination of the previous cell state, which was information carried thus far by the network, which was helpful so far, but maybe that's not helpful anymore. And so we allow it to forget that information through this forget gate. And maybe now it is really helpful for the network to carry forward some new information from this candidate cell state. And so we can set those I sub T elements accordingly very high. So you can see this step four is the crux, is the power of the LSTM. It's allowing us to dynamically and based on the inputs we're looking at in the current moment, so based on the word I just saw, you can say, whoa, that word is super important. I'm gonna make sure to encode that in my current cell state and pass that forward in the network so that future words, 100 words from now, 1,000 words from now, are able to use that information if they want. And I'll just forget some stuff that came before because it's not gonna come up again probably. And so if that story still doesn't make too much sense, I promise we'll revisit in a more visual way in just a moment. So hopefully it all clicks if it hasn't already. But there's still two steps left because there's still the question about uh, how do we set the new hidden state or the new output state, H sub T. And that's what steps five and six are for. So step five is decide what to use from the new cell state. So in step four, we created the new cell state and the primary job of the cell state is to get passed down further and further down the network so we can remember these short-term dependencies long-term which is by the way where the name long short-term memory comes from because we're able using this architecture to take short-term dependencies and remember them long-term in the network. But the other secondary job of the cell state is to affect what the current output is going to be because as much as we've been talking about the LSTM being really good at remembering long-term dependencies, it still needs to do the basic job of any recurrent neural network which is tell me what the current next word is going to be. And so we do that by applying, you guessed it, another gate. So this form looks the exact same as the forget gate and the input gate. This is just an O, so it's called the output gate. It has its own U matrix and its V matrix and its B vector, um, but otherwise the same kind of stuff going on here, sigmoid activation function again. This output gate is telling us which pieces of information from the current cell state are helpful in order to predict immediately what the next word is going to be. And so we set that here. And step six is basically just creating the new hidden state or the new output state by multiplying our output gate, which again is telling us which pieces and how much of information from this new cell state is helpful in this current moment to predict the next word immediately. And then we multiply it by 10H of C sub T. Phew, so not gonna lie, that was a lot. There's a lot to go through here. I had to go through this several, several times to really get an idea of what's going on. And so what we're going to do next is appeal to you visual learners out there. So currently we went through the LSTM verbally and mathematically, and so that we technically have down, but it can still be really hard to put the picture together if we haven't looked at a diagram. So let's now tie all of these six steps together in a visual diagram that tells us what affects what, what depends on what. And hopefully by doing so, by looking at this causal diagram here, we'll be able to get a better intuitive idea about how exactly this network works. So you can see here, I've put all of the symbols that we care about. One thing to note off the bat, there's a lot more symbols than a simple recurrent neural network. In the simple recurrent neural network, we just had X's and H's, just two types of symbols. Now we have X's and H's and F and I and O and C. Well, that's like three times as many symbols, but we'll draw all the arrows between them and we'll see how they interact. One thing we can simplify here is that when you look at the x sub t, the current new input at this time step, and the h sub t minus one, which is the previous hidden state, they only affect things together. So if you look at all steps one through six, you see that anytime we're setting one of these other variables here, we're using both x and h, not just one or the other. So I'm gonna draw just single arrows from this unit of x and h but that's gonna mean that we used both of them. So that's just gonna reduce the number of arrows in our diagram and make things easier to see. So let's do this thing. Let's go step by step and draw the arrows correspondingly. So step one, propose a new candidate cell state that depends on X and H. So that's our new candidate cell state that depends on X and H. So we can draw that arrow here and we can mark this as step one. Step two, 
Decide what to keep or forget from the last cell state, so that's setting the forget gate, which also depends on x and h. While we're on this page, the input gate also just depends on x and h. And so we can set both the forget gate and the input gate as depending on just x and h. So this is steps two and three respectively. Now we get the awesome crucial step of the LSTM step four, which is that we're gonna create the new cell state C sub t using these four variables, f, i, c from the last time period and the candidate c from this time period. So the first thing in that equation was that f and c sub t minus one get element wise multiplied. So we'll just represent that by this little combination right here. The next thing that happens is that i and the new candidate state get element wise multiplied. So we'll just represent that by this little merging arrow here. And then we use both those pieces of information to inform what the new cell state is going to be. So that's affected by this merged result and also affected by this merged result here. So now steps five and six. Step five, decide what to use from the current cell state that we just set in step four for the output. And so we see this output is also just affected by X and H. So we can draw this guy here. And let me label this whole thing with step four. And then this thing is gonna be step five. And then finally, finally step six is that we're going to output the new hidden state or the output state and that's going to be affected by O and C sub T. So O and C sub T, so we just draw an arrow there, we draw an arrow there, and together these two things are going to be step six. And so these are all the arrows. There's not a ton of them, and you can see that four of these arrows is using the current X and the H from the previous time step to create these four variables, so the three gates and the candidate cell state. And then step four is simply doing the merging, so this is, I would say, the key to understanding the LSTMs or the most important step of the LSTM is that the C sub T is using whatever and however much information is helpful to carry long term in the network from the previous cell state and whatever and however much is helpful to carry forward in the network from the current candidate cell state. And then steps five and six are basically just used to calculate H sub T, which again is immediately right now what is the network going to predict as the next word or next stock price. So the last couple things we'll do in this video, I wanna quickly recap. I know there's a lot of symbols here. Um, I've tried to color code them as much as possible. So the pink things are gates. The green things have to do with the cell state. The blue things have to do with the hidden or output state. And the black variables have to do with the current input. So the next thing I wanna do here is just go over, recap, what is the job of each of these different things? So X sub T is probably the most straightforward. It's just trying to bring new things into the network at each time step. So you might have read the sentence, the dog ran, and then the next word would be up. And the role of the embedding for that word up is basically introduce whatever information comes with that word up. So that's pretty straightforward. H sub T is deciding what to output at the current time step. So if you read up to the dog ran, H sub T is going to be targeted to best predict that the next word should be up. And the network is going to adjust its weight so that it is good at that. It is good at deciding the next word should be up and the next word after that is two and so on and so on and so on. C sub T is deciding what information to carry forward. So C sub T is saying that, you know what? I am going to primarily focus on how to combine past and current information and leave past information unchanged if it needs to be unchanged so I don't run into the vanishing or exploding gradient problem and just let that information have another avenue to flow through the entire network so that if I need this information way down the road, it's there waiting for me instead of being completely destroyed by the vanishing or exploding gradient problem. And this F, this I, these O are called the forget input and output gates. And these are also very, very important to the LSTM. So I would say the key ideas of the LSTM are this uh, cell state and these gates. These regulate the amounts of information that is flowing through the network. Without these, we would still get the vanishing and exploding gradient problem because there's no way to say how much or which entries from a particular vector I want to carry forward in the network unchanged. Without these, the vectors would be changed and they'd be changed by some multiplicative factor which geometric is going to explode or vanish over time. But with the addition of these gates, we allow information to flow through the network unchanged if it is helpful for future predictions in the network. So hopefully between the step-by-step, -step, the mathematical form of the LSTM, this graphical form of the LSTM, just talking about what each of these role is in the LSTM, 
we're able to get a holistic idea about what they are and how they solve the problem that recurrent neural networks, the simple ones, could not. But the last, last thing I want to do in this video is talk about how does that solve our original problem? Because for me, even after going through the math and going through the visuals here, I still was a little skeptical about, well, is this necessarily going to provide a mechanism that's going to solve our original problem? And the drawing this very silly little diagram here actually did help me with that. And so I wanted to present it to you as well. So our original problem, if you remember here, was by the time we were getting to predicting the word after and, we want to remember something about dog, which was much earlier in the network. Does the LSTM architecture give us a pathway to do that? So let's first draw this little mini diagram here for when the word dog, which is x2, the vector x2, first gets introduced into the network. So at that time step, we have x2, which is the word dog, the embedding for that, and the previous hidden state, h1. And so this little picture here is the same as this picture here. I've just put explicit subscripts here because we're talking about the second time step here. So x2 and h1 are going to affect the forget gate, the input gate, the output gate, the candidate state, and then we're going to set the new cell state, c2, and using the new cell state and the output gate, we're going to set h2. But let's draw a picture of what the new candidate cell state, c tilde 2, might look like. So it can be a vector of whatever size it wants to be. But let's say that there is some region of this vector in the middle, which represents the fact that the word we just looked at is dog. So this little region here is saying that, you know what, that part represents dog. Now the LSTM can say that, hey, that region of the candidate state vector is really important for me to remember long term, because I know I'm going to need to say something about a dog. The way it's able to encode that is when it comes up with the new cell state C2, it's able to use the power of this input gate to explicitly tell the network that it needs to remember this region of this candidate cell state vector. And so when we're setting the C2, we can keep this unchanged or very minimally changed so that this part of the new cell state that's going to go into the next time period still is mentioning or representing the fact that there was a dog somewhere earlier in our sentence. What's important to know here is that outside of that region, it's allowed to do whatever it wants. So outside of that region, so above this region and below this region, it can keep whatever it wants from the candidate. It can use stuff from the previous cell state that's also important to remember long term. But it's important for us that within this region, it's remembering the fact that, hey, there's a dog here, I want to remember that long term. And the other important thing to realize is that now the next thing that happens in our network, it needs to output what the next word might be. Now the next word may have nothing to do with the word dog, and that's why we have this output gate. Because this output gate is saying that, well, the cell state is trying to pack in information that's important to remember long term. But right now I want the output gate to only keep whatever parts of that information are necessary to predict the next word. A more obvious example of that, if we go back to our sentence, by the time we've gotten up to the dog ran up to the orange, and we've just seen the word orange, well, even though the current cell state might be holding information about the word dog, we probably don't want to use that to predict the next word, which is actually going to be cat. And so we're able to use this output gate to selectively just forget that for now, even though we are making sure to store that to pass to the next time step. And so here we can actually just forget the fact that this had anything to do with dog so that it becomes easier for us to predict cat in that moment. But the key insight is again that this cell state, C2 goes to C3, goes to C4, goes to C5, goes all the way down to C8. And because of the fact that we have these forget and input gates, at every one of those time steps, we're able to make the same exact decision as we did during this time step, which was to keep that information from the previous cell state, keep this information minimally changed or completely unchanged. So that by the time we get to C8, and we've seen the dog ran up to the orange cat and what? Now we have this region of information waiting for us in the eighth cell state, C8, which was there since the second cell state, C2. And now we're able to use that explicitly to say, oh, there was a dog earlier in the sentence. The dog barked. And we're able to do that now, which we were unable to do in these simple recurrent neural networks. So hopefully this kind of silly example here in my silly little dog picture, if that wasn't obvious already, kind of helps show the mechanism by which we are able to pass information unchanged through the network while also not making it mandatory for the current output to use that information as a result of this output gate, which is exactly the amazing power of LSTMs. So hopefully that helped understand LSTMs more than you did before. If you have any questions at all, please leave them in the comments section below.
Thank you so much for watching until now. Like and subscribe for more videos just like this, and I will see you all next time.